From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. David Parsons. Well... I called Mr. Ecker and he told me where you're staying. I was just on my way out to your home, Mrs. Parsons. Oh, I'd rather you didn't come to the house, Mr. Dollar. Couldn't I meet you somewhere? Well, sure. But better still, why don't I come by your hotel and pick you up? That'll be all right. Fifteen minutes, is that too soon? Oh, that's fine. Uh, Mrs. Parsons? Yes? Your father-in-law know you're meeting me? If he did, I think he'd kill me. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25 Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. <laughs> Item 2, $4.55, one long-distance phone call. To Dave Blaine, Chief Investigator for Eastern Casualty. I explained to him that in spite of our information that David Parsons, Jr. had been missing for 10 days... People in Los Angeles connected with him seemed indifferent or irritated by an investigation... I told him how old man Parsons had tried to throw me out three times when I got around to suggesting that perhaps his son might have flown the coop with some money and bonds. Blaine told me to keep trying and keep on trying to get to the bottom of it. I took him at his word. It was a little after two o'clock when I saw Mrs. Dorothy Parsons pull up in front of the Beverly Hilton lobby. She wore a ribbon to hold her hair back in the convertible. A sundress showed off a pair of well-tanned shoulders. The dark glasses, the cigarette holder, and the smile did the rest in making her a very pretty woman. I suppose I look worried. I keep you waiting long? No, 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 not at all. What matter? I don't know. Yes, I do, too. It it just struck me. I'm here to see about your missing husband. Now it looks like we're going on a picnic. I think you don't have to wear sackcloth and ashes to do your job. No, really, do you? Well, it sometimes helps on a job like this. You disapprove of me, don't you? I disapprove of everybody. I have to, Mrs. Parsons. All the time? Forever? Only until the thing's straightened out. Until you separate the chaff from the wheat, I suppose. Yeah. Where are we going? I thought you might like a drive down by the ocean. I'd rather be facing you across a desk. You shan't do that, Mr. Dollar. I won't allow it. Stop looking so glum. How's that? I don't know. I just don't know. Would you feel any better if you faced me across a luncheon table? That's as close to a desk as I can think of. Yeah, let's try that out. I gave her what I could of a smile and let her think it over. She drove well, keeping her eyes to the road, both hands on the wheel. She was a careful kind. The rearview mirror was adjusted two or three times, looking for traffic cops. We went off Sunset Boulevard and onto the road that is set right by the ocean. The sun was shining. The air was warm. And I got to thinking, what business did I have worrying about a missing man on such a nice day? Oh. What is it? Come on. I'm tired of driving. Let's walk along that lovely strip of beach. Oh, uh, now, wait please, a minute. Please, Mr. Yeah. Dollar, please. It's such a lovely day, and the air is so good. Walk with me. Talk with me. Just a little while, and then we can talk about all these other things, please. I married David when I was not quite 18. He was almost 30. You see, that was... Fourteen years ago. Fourteen years. Go on. He joined his father's firm, and he's been there ever since. We live well, socially, economically. I guess I belong to the keep your social position in mind club, don't I? I don't know. What do you think of me? I uh, met you today to talk about your husband, Mrs. Parsons. But I've been talking about my husband. I told you about meeting him, about being married to him. What else is there to tell? Now tell me about missing him. What can I tell you about that? Well, where he is, for one thing. I don't know. Any ideas? No, none. You're so pretty, I almost believe you. Oh, you are a human being. But I don't believe you. I don't care. Tell me how pretty I am. (laughs) 
I don't understand you. I didn't understand your father-in-law. David Parsons is missing. No one wants to talk about it, do anything about it, make any moves. Now, what is this? You're cross with me now. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I'd assume you'd want me to talk to somebody about your husband. You'd want to talk to somebody, too, that you'd, that you'd want him back, want to know if he's well, if he's in trouble. And what happens? You spend an hour on a sunny afternoon showing me your best profile, doing everything, but getting down to the business at hand. I don't get it. I'm sorry. I guess I don't blame you. What is it you want to know? When did you see him last? Last Tuesday morning at breakfast at home. Tell me about him. There's nothing to tell, really. He ate his breakfast, read his paper, put on his coat, kissed me and left. I called his office at noon about something or other and his secretary told me he hadn't come in. I really didn't know he wasn't around till Wednesday afternoon late. How's that? Well, Tuesday night I... I went out with friends. Wednesday I slept late. I presumed David was in bed when I came in. I didn't look in his bedroom. Wednesday afternoon, Mr. Ecker called and asked to speak to David. Mr. Ecker told me David hadn't been in his office all day Tuesday. I checked his bedroom, and his bed hadn't been slept in Tuesday night, so I called my father-in-law. Why didn't you call the police? Why should I? It only seems reasonable to me. Go on. Mr. Parsons told me not to mention the matter to anyone, that he'd take care of it. He hinted... Oh. I'm bad at this, Johnny, because well, you have no idea... I mean, Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't hint. He's a very blunt person. I met him this morning, yeah. But I'll say he hinted that David might have gone off with someone else. I see. Has he ever disappeared before? Oh, yes, many times. When was the last time? Oh, last fall. For three days he was gone. And before that, it was in the spring. He was gone for a matter of five or six days. When he came home on these occasions, uh, what did he say? What did he do? Nothing. Oh, no, I can't believe that. I mean, if he's gone a few days without leaving any kind of word, when he returned, he must have had some explanation for it. Oh, I suppose he did. He might have said something about getting even. I, I don't recall. Well, look at me. Now, this is serious. I'm looking at you. You said you've been married to him 14 years. You said he joined his father's firm shortly after. Yes. What did he do before that? He studied and traveled. Didn't work? Well, he wrote or something. I don't know. What kind of a man is he? He's David Parsons, Jr. He's impeccable, brilliant, and honest. As a husband? Aren't you overstepping yourself somewhere? A lot of personal questions will have to be answered about him by someone. He's a very devoted husband and father. Except for those times when he disappears. Except for those times, yes. Do you suppose he'll reappear this time? Yes, of course. Why? Don't you? He's your husband, not mine. The wind's coming up. Yes. Feel like some lunch? I feel very much like going home. All right. Mrs. Parsons. Yes. Did you expect me to make love to you out here this afternoon? What kind of question is that? It's to the point. Did you? Yes. Why? It's not a nice question to ask me. I think sometimes I'm quite attractive. I think you must be attractive all the time. Thank you. Why didn't you kiss me? We, uh, don't have to go into that. Unless, of course, you want to tell me why you stalled me all afternoon. Do you? Touché, Mr. Dollar. One thing more. When I spoke with you earlier, you asked my advice in this matter. I advise you call the police about your husband. Did you? You know I did. I also advise your father-in-law to do the same thing. He said he'd kill me and himself before he'd call the police in. You said, or I thought you said, you'd call him in anyhow. That you were concerned about your husband and wanted him found. Did I get that wrong? I don't want any police, Mr. Dollar. I don't think they're necessary. David will come back. No police. What made you change your mind? Your father-in-law? You said you only had one more question. I lied. I've got a thousand questions. I should call home. Come on. We walked up to the highway and climbed back into the car. She drove to the nearest filling station and public telephone booth. I waited in the car while she made a phone call. Some high school kids drove up in a jalopy and sweatshirts and jeans. They waved 10 pounds of wieners at me for no reason at all and 
Asked me if I'd like to go on a wiener fry. I told him no. An old man with a bamboo fishing pole came in. He dropped a soggy gunny sack on the pavement while he disappeared around at the back. I went over and peeked in. Three pretty good-sized perch smelled out at me. I looked off at the ocean, just in time to see a pair of surfboard riders catch the creamy top of a roller, climb up on their feet, and wave to their girlfriends sitting in the sand. Nothing was wrong with the world. Nothing at all. Life was going on just fine. David Parsons, Jr. had been missing ten days, and nothing was wrong at all. I lit up a cigarette. What difference did it make if a man was missing ten days? Not a bit. Especially to his wife, who looked her prettiest when she told me practically nothing about his disappearance. The ashes fell on my lap. I'm sorry I took so terribly long, Mr. Dollar. I had to call my father-in-law's home, too. There was a message for me. Look, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go over your head, your father-in-law's head, everybody's. When I get back in town, I'm going to tell the police about this. I just decided while I was sitting waiting for you. There won't be any need for that. Huh? David's come back. What? He's home. Now, that was the message. He'll be there when we get there. You see, all of your worry was for nothing. You and I, we could have had a perfectly lovely afternoon if we'd known this, couldn't we? If you say so, Mrs. Parsons. Look out! <laughs> You all right, brother? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you take it easy. Better give me a hand with her. Can somebody call an ambulance? Yeah, sure. You you take it easy. I'll take care of her until... What? What, what, what is it? I'm sorry, mister. She's dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, trouble comes early and stays late. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Roy Rowan speaking.